Elizabethan Exeter was ranked fifth after London, Norwich, Newcastle and Bristol in both wealth and population and was the most important city between London and Land's End. The local recorder and historian of the city, John Hooker, described the city as being chiefly inhabited by merchants, curzies, clothiers and all other sorts of artificers and wealthiest. From one of these wealthy families, Peel, although he had become a lawyer, he was born in 1560 in the Harrison near Plymouth. Aged 17, he attended Exeter College, Oxford. His first wife died, but in 1618, he married a second wife, Alice Evely, and at that time, he was living at Bobby Tracy. When he lived in Exeter, at the end of his life, his house was in the parish of All Hallows, in the West Quarter. Approaching Exeter from Plymouth, he would enter the city from the west, obtaining an excellent view of it. The situation of this city, said Hooker, is very pleasant and agreeable, being set upon a little hill among many hills. For the whole country around is mountainous and full of hills. It is pendent towards the south and west, and in such sort that be the streets never so foul or filthy, yet with a shower of rain they are cleansed and made sweet. Ellis Hill would have to come across the 12th century X Bridge, which had 18 arches. It went right up to the west gate, as the present 4th Street was then marshland. This meant that the bridge was at least 700 feet long. far longer than the present 170 foot long bridge. A few of these original arches remain today. Thus the old bridge is still carrying the weight of modern traffic over half of its original length. The Romans first erected walls around the city, but those proved inadequate and had to be strengthened by the Saxon, Norman and medieval kings in order to withstand many attacks, such as that by the Danes in 892. By the time of Ellis Hill, there were five gates. West Gate by the bridge. Water Gate, which was recently cut into the walls to provide access to the newly developed quay. South Gate, the Great Gate, was the main entrance to the city for travellers from London. Contained in the South Gate was the old Exeter prison, described as one of the foulest holes in England. The East Gate was just below the castle. At the higher end of the city, said Hooker, is a very old and ancient castle named Rougemont. That is to say, the Red Hill, taking that name of the red soil or earth whereupon it is situated. It hath a goodly and pleasant prospect towards the seas, for between that and it is no hill at all. The first record of it dates to 1068, after Exeter's defiance of William the Conqueror. But in the time of Ellis Hill, Hooker informs us in 1580, it is in great ruin and decay. All that remained is the Norman gateway, perhaps Exeter's oldest building still intact. The rounded arch is typically Norman in style, while the small triangular windows behind show that Saxon influence was still alive. Just below the castle stood the north gate, After coming through the west gate, with its view of the New Haven and the barges at the quayside, Ellis Hill would proceed up Stepcot Hill, which was the original main street of the medieval city.
were steps up at each side for pedestrians and a narrow cobbled roadway for pack horses. Today we are reminded of the varied activities and trades of medieval Exeter and the gregarious habits of its inhabitants by the ancient street names. The Street of the Water Bearers. The dominance of the church is recalled by these names. The Street of St Mary Magdalene. The Street of Priests. Romans first forged settlement and called it Isca Domnoniorum. The many churches, including the Abbey of St Mary and St Peter, Hustle in 1068. By the time it had been drained, Exeter was the trading centre for Devon. Wool and cloth were the main businesses within the city. The sheep were kept mainly in small flocks scattered around the countryside. The chief symbol of this is the Tucker's Hall, standing in the Fore Street. It is the most beautiful hall in Exeter. Its richly carved panelling was completed in 1638 and vividly displays the wealth of the merchants. In the hall are reminders of the cloth trade of Ellis Heels Day, a wool winder and behind a spinning wheel. In the panelling is the coat of arms of the fullers, weavers and shearmen. Much of Exeter's cloth was exported overseas to Saint-Malo in Brittany and to the Biscay ports of La Rochelle and Bordeaux. Wines were brought back to Exeter in exchange. Ships also went empty to Newfoundland, where the merchants would probably buy cod from the English and French fishermen there. This fish would then be taken in the Exeter ships to be sold in the Biscay ports. There was much trade with the Iberian ports of San Sebastian, Lisbon and Malaga. Dyes, tobacco and ginger were brought back to Exeter. Exeter reflected England's growing prosperity during the reign of Elizabeth I with the foundation of the Merchant Adventurers in 1560. The court book entitled 16 merchants the right to hold property, to sue and be sued, to rule and govern the merchants and to make their own bylaws. The Act Book of the Company is held today in the City Record Office. These 16 merchants, and many more, all lived within easy access of the city, and many of their houses still remain more or less intact. But how many people today know? Timber framing was a method of construction mainly used during this time. This technique enabled those who could afford it, namely the merchants, to embellish the exterior of their houses. second half of the 16th century, increased opportunity for display was made possible through the practice of building houses in pairs so that the designer had a larger surface area to work on. These houses illustrate probably the most striking feature about these buildings was the manner in which they projected over the street. Here is a model of a timber framed house, typical of Ellis Hill's time. There were usually two distinct portions, front and rear. Inside, on the ground floor, there was a shop and parlour at the front, and at the back, the kitchen. The main living room of the house, the hall, was on the first floor. Above the hall was the main bedroom. Servants' quarters were at the rear, 
At the top was the little chamber. A good example of a merchant's house is at 67 South Street, now a butcher's shop. This is a three-story dwelling built about 1600. It is timber framed and the building is set upon two chimney stacks made of heavy tree stone. The original centrally placed dog-legged staircase with turned balusters has survived. On the first floor we have the hall. This spacious room has an elaborately moulded plastered beam and cornice. Set into the corner of the two panels, into which the ceiling is divided, there are plaster representations of flowers and plants. The rose, the tulip, the thistle and the vine. On the top floor are four chambers which have the original oak doors. Because of Exeter's importance, it had long enjoyed the right to govern itself, confirmed by every new monarch in a charter. Most of the merchants would be freemen of the city and would be eligible to be elected as older men and possibly mayors. The city government resided in the Guild Hall. The Guildhall is believed originally to have been built in 1160. However, it was not until the late 16th century that any great alterations were made. Here, the mayor and his brethren of 24 aldermen sat, in the same places as the modern city councillors sit to administer the city's affairs. The conspicuous feature of the Guildhall is the carved oak panelling completed in 1594 with the arms of notable citizens and benefactors and those having their trade associated with the Guildhall. One such person was John Heal, uncle of Ellis Heal, who was recorder in 1593. On the 2nd of November, 1592, in a council minute, it was mentioned that the front of the hall was in decay and should be redone. The work of construction lasted two years and cost £782. Freestone from beer was extensively used, being conveyed mostly by sea. Stone was also brought from Pemore Quarry and a small amount from Northern Hay Quarry. Purbeck stone was used for the paving in front of the Guildhall and timber was obtained from Duryard Woods. During the whole Tudor period, the Guildhall was the scene of musical entertainments and plays. A major problem facing the city was the quarrel with the Earls of Devon. In 1284, Hocker tells us, The Countess of Devon builded sudden weirs upon the river of X. Hooker's map here shows two weirs, Calabair Weir and St. Leonard's Weir. Built in 1564, the same year as the canal was begun. Calabair Weir is now called Blackalla Weir. St. Leonard is Trues Weir. Exeter's direct access to the sea was the cause of turbulent quarrelling for many years. By Ellis Heel's time, a canal to circumvent the river had become essential. This first canal was only three feet deep and came into the X just above Countess Weir Bridge. But it was the first canal of its kind using the new device of a pound lock. 
as well as the dispute which the city authorities had with the Courtney's, their relations with the church had long been unhappy. The merchants were jealous of the wealth and privileges of the cathedral clergy, who were immune from all control of the guild hall. The small Saxon Abbey church was the first cathedral when Exeter became the head of the diocese in 1050. It was too small for the honour, so Bishop Farrabust decided to rebuild in grander style. All that remains of that Norman cathedral, completed in 1133, are the towers. These are unique because they stand north and south of the main structure. The completed Norman cathedral might have looked like this, but it was soon architecturally outdated by the new Gothic style as at Salisbury, where this spectacular vaulting was envied by Bishop Bronscombe. This 13th century bishop therefore completely rebuilt the choir in the decorated style. Then the nave was rebuilt, continuing the same style by Bishop Grandison, and the result was a unity which Grandison claimed surpassed every church of its kind in England and Wales. But it was Bronson's vision that he is justly given a worthy tomb in his cathedral. Bronson was also responsible for the early English work at the Lady Chapel. On the exterior of the south wall can be seen the uncompleted arch where the two stages of rebuilding join together. When Bishop Grandison died in 1369, the cathedral was substantially complete. Nowhere in the world is there so long and unified a stretch of Gothic vaulting, which with the sonnet has been likened to a forest in springtime. On the north side of the nave is the Minstrel's Gallery, built by Bishop Grandison. It shows 12 angels playing upon musical instruments. The citerol, bagpipe and recorder. Trumpet, hand organ, guitar. Viol, harp, juice harp. And finally, shawl, timbrel and cymbals. In the choir, the bishop's throne stands 59 feet high. It was completed by Bishop Stapleton in 1316 and is made of decks of workmanship, was put together without a single nail so that it could be dismantled and hidden away in time of danger. In Ellisfield's time, the beauty of these things might be greater than today, mainly because the cathedral was comparatively young, a mere 250 years old. But what he saw is substantially what we see. Having contributed so much to the well-being of the city, Ellis Heal and his wife Alice were accorded the high honour of being buried in St Andrew's Chapel in the cathedral in 1636. There lies his tombstone. In his will, he dedicated his estates to some charitable and goodly use.